Welcome to or welcome back to the Chitin Corner. We're so glad you're here to learn all things fungal. Sit back and relax. This will be fun. In our first lesson, we're going to learn a new language. Didn't you know, mycology has one of its own? It won't be too bad, and today we have Buddy here in the lower right-hand corner to help us see our budding potential. Fungi belong to their own diverse and mysterious kingdom, made of wild shapes and features. But what makes something a fungus? It comes down to these five traits they all share. They use absorptive nutrition. Unlike plants, they lack chlorophyll and they're heterotrophic, which means they don't make their own food. They're also eukaryotic, so they have a nucleus that distinguishes them from bacteria. And most importantly, they have chitin in their cell wall. So, how do you speak fungus? These organisms have evolved such unique shapes and features that they've also evolved their own structural language. Buddy is excited to see us start with yeast. Although he's not a complicated guy, Buddy is actually the best a yeast could hope to become. Though, we may have to restrain him. Blastoconidium, or blastoconidia for the plural, is a fancy term for a yeast cell. Technically, it's a spore or conidium formed by budding along a hypha, pseudohypha, or single cell. This brings us into the hyphae. Hyphae generally refers to true hyphae on the left. These have septations, cross walls, with no constriction. They look like ladders. Pseudohyphae on the right are false hyphae often associated with yeast. They have constrictions and look like sausage links. These are the vegetative, non-reproductive structures of fungi. Okay, buddy, we need you to stay put. Buddy's strange-looking restraint is called mycelium. This is a mat of intertwined hyphae that constitutes the colony surface of a mold. Many think hyphae look like spaghetti. If hyphae are spaghetti, then this is the spaghetti bowl. While we're still on the topic, there are two basic kinds of hypha, septate on the left and aseptate on the right. The vast majority of hypha are septate, so when in doubt, go with septate. Still imprisoned? Buddy is trying for good behavior, so he's going to help us knock out a bunch of mycology terms with aspergillus. Aspergillus is a common genus of mold found in our environment. The diagram shows all structures in an aspergillus conidiophore. The term conidiophore usually refers to the entire structure that houses the reproductive structures of a mold as they branch off of the main hypha. Then we have the bulbous vesicle, the phyllides and conidia, asexual spores, at the end. Aspergillus is one of several molds that produces conidia in chains. The conidia always arise from the phyllides. If there are two rows of cells here, the first row are called metula. Species with metula and phyllides are called biseriata, while those species with only one row of cells, the phyllides, are called uniseriate. Penicillium is a similar and famous genus of mold with similar structures to aspergillus minus the vesicle. Good job assimilating all of that. As alluded to previously, there are sexual and asexual states of many fungi. For these, the sexual state is called the teleomorph to make it sound upscale, while the asexual state is called the anamorph. A somewhat obnoxious rule in mycology that began long ago and continues to this day is that each state, sexual and asexual, will possess their own name as though they are completely separate organisms when, in fact, they are one. Con artists. Fortunately, sexual states are seen less frequently in the lab than their asexual brethren. And again, conidium or conidia refers to asexual propagules, while the common term spore is reserved for sexual propagules. True spores often have prefixes such as zygospore or ascospore, depending on which phylum they belong to. Conidia may also come with elaborate upscale nomenclature to show up their teleomorph rivals. Common ones include macroconidia and microconidia, which refers to different sized conidia in single organisms, chlamydoconidia, or false conidia, and arthroconidia, which break down directly from the main hyphae. Fabulous job for making it all the way through every mycology term in existence. 
I'm glad we didn't leave out any fruiting bodies such as Parathesia, Cleistothesia, Spherules, and Pycnidia. And when we covered mucoralis group structures like Sporangiophore, Rhizoids, Sporangium, and Apophysis, and then all the Aspergillus features like Hula cells, Foot cells, Dichotomus, and Columnar. And don't forget the finer features like Muriform, Fusiform, Tuberculate, and Geniculate. And of course, my five tiny things like Osteole, Hilum, and Denticle. Yeah, remember all that. But seriously, there is an entire world of mycology to discover, and it's all good stuff. Right, buddy? Now that your head is full, let's move on. So, how are fungi organized? Taxonomy and mycology is currently going through a lot of revisions, so stay tuned if you're interested in this topic. Classically, they are divided into four phylums starting with Zygomycota. This group is the only group with aceptate hyphae. The hyphae are also very broad, with some structures visible to the naked eye. They reproduce asexually through sporangia and sexually via zygospores. The Ascomycota include a wide variety of fungi with septate hyphae. They reproduce asexually by canidia and sexually by ascospores in sacs called assi. The Basidiomycota is a group that is barely relevant to medical mycology, with Cryptococcus being the only clinically significant member. The group includes mushrooms and a vibrantly colored yeast called Rhodotorula. They reproduce asexually by conidia and sexually by basidiospores. Deuteromycota is last and definitely not least. This is the big boy that includes the vast majority of the clinically important fungi. Candida species, hyaline and dematiaceous fungi, dermatophytes and systemic fungi all belong to the Deuteromycota. They reproduce asexually only by conidia. Back to a few basics before we wrap things up. Oh boy, Buddy sees the word yeast and reveals he enjoys being the center of attention. Putting aside all of this taxonomy stuff that isn't typically relevant in the medical mycology lab, most fungi are grouped into one of two baskets, yeasts and molds. Yeasts typically don't have aerial mycelium. In other words, Colonies appear creamy or dry as opposed to fuzzy. Molds, on the other hand, typically have aerial mycelium. If you've never seen aerial mycelium or a mold colony, then you are entirely too diligent about checking your refrigerator for expired items. But what about temperature? Although many fungi will grow at a variety of temperatures and there are several exceptions that go against the trends, molds generally grow better at 30 degrees Celsius while yeasts grow better at 37 degrees Celsius. Because yeasts are often recovered in the bacteriology lab at 37 degrees, mycology cultures are incubated at 30 degrees to check for mold. Dimorphic fungi, also called systemic fungi, act like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde when incubated at different temperatures. At 37 degrees, they appear as yeasts, and at 30 degrees, they appear as molds, each with their own unique colony and microscopic. Cool but scary as these are highly pathogenic. Clear as mud? Finally, we'll address media. So, how do you grow fungi? I always say molds are like cats, doing what they want and when they please, and in this case, growing on whatever they feel like. But, in order to create the conditions that allow all molds to grow, we need to use an enriched medium like brain heart infusion agar with blood, which sounds lovely, and a selective medium like inhibitory mold, Agar, which inhibits bacteria. Sabara dextrose. Agar may also be used as well as potato dextrose or potato flake, agar for mold sporulation. There are also several varieties of these that contain antibiotics to suppress bacteria, which may grow faster than fungi and overgrow them, preventing their recovery. Mycology can be very adventurous. I've always found it exciting to prepare a colorful mold for examination, not knowing what I'm going to see at the microscope. Molds are largely still identified by a microscope prep called lactophenol cotton blue, which we'll cover in a later video. Because there are so many rare and exotic fungi that can be identified simply with a cotton blue, it allows for a higher level of independence from so much of the technology that dominates the rest of the clinical laboratory. It's mostly just you and your scope and a bunch of resources and books. It's a great field for those who like the idea of carving out an esoteric little niche that never bores. Thank you for visiting, and please leave a like, 
comment, and subscribe.